Father, this morning, we just thank you, Father, for your presence, for visiting us, for being with us even now. I pray, Father, this morning, once again you would speak to us. Those among us who woke up early in the morning and heard your voice, you will speak to us again. To those who were tired or overslept, I pray in your mercy, you will speak now. But to all, Father, I pray you will give them the gift to hear, the ability to hear your voice, to hear your voice. Father from heaven, who speaks louder and louder, clearer and clearer as the end comes. The urgency is in your heart. And I pray, Father, the same urgency will be in our hearts to hear what you speak. That we would be prepared. We would be ready. We would be watchful. We would be prayerful. Speak to us this morning, O oh Lord. Let every other voice be stilled. Let there be no distraction, no lethargy. Let the Spirit Himself stir His children up so that they can hear what the Spirit says. Speak to us, O oh Father, this morning. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Somebody once told me, Pastor, when I listened to all your messages over the seven years, six years, or those who have been hearing even before that, the old messages, which is not there in the website, they say, at the core of it, doesn't matter from which part you preach, they all sound the same. You seems to be telling the same thing in so many different words. At the end of the day, that is what is true. Right. At the end of the day, God could have written one book with one chapter with one line. But he chose to write 60 books with 40 different authors over 1400 years with the same message. But different ways. But God sometimes puts it across gently, sometimes politely, sometimes harshly. But the point is, that we hear. Okay. You could say the same thing in different ways, but like you could tell a woman, you look like a fresh breath of spring. She would be flattered. You could also tell the woman the same thing in different words, like you could tell her, you look like the end of a hard winter. I'm not sure whether she would be pleased. <laughs> but speaking in terms of literature, it means the same thing. Are you getting the picture? God uses both languages. He uses both. Sometimes he's very nice, very polite, and tells children, children. Sometimes he calls us rogues. Okay, but it's the same God. So this morning, but gentlemen, be careful when you choose your words when you speak to women, okay? Don't try to be God. <laughs> Don't try to be God. Choose your words carefully. So this morning, I want to turn first to Philippians chapter two, 3, verses 12 to 14. Because this last Sunday of the six months, six months are over. Half yearly examination time. Six months are over. And as we sit, people of almost every age group, we just take a look at how do we see our spiritual walk in the six months. Here is a role model for any believer. Any man, any woman who is running the race. And look at what he says. If any means, 
I may attain. Okay, verse 12. Not that I have attained, already attained, or I am already perfected, but I press on. I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, let me tell you, I didn't check the songs the worship leader picked this Sunday. And if you know the song, and the words of the worship leader was all about the upward call of God. Okay, moving on. And here is a man who is saying, I press on. I press on. And I do not count myself to have apprehended. I am pressing on. I am pressing on. I am pressing on. I am moving on. Upward, I am moving on. Now, the book of Philippians was written, or the letter to the church in Philippi, was written almost at the same time as the little epistle as Philemon. In Philemon chapter 1 and verse 9, we will look at the same person who wrote this because he will give you a picture of this person in that letter. chapter. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you being such a one as Paul, the aged. And I we will see the old man. Now does that suddenly put Philippians 3 verses 12 to 14 in a different light? This is an old man writing. And he say, I am in the race. Don't count me out because I am old. I am in the race. I am running. And I am pressing on for what Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Years and years and years and years back on the road to Damascus, he grabbed hold of me. And I'm running the race, and I'm still running the race, and I haven't finished my race, and I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. Remember, that should be true about each one of us. Each one of us. Young people, remember two things when Sunday or Wednesday sermon. One, keep your eyes on me. Otherwise, I'll call you by name. Johan, I will call you by name. Okay? And then when I call you by name, don't stare at me. (laughs) I told you, I was a classroom teacher. If you stare at me, you're saying, okay, you want me to look at you? You will regret that. Okay? Okay. Look at me. Don't stare at me. If you stare at me, that also means you're not listening. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ Jesus. Remember this, all of us, I believe, started this race at some point in our life. Don't quit. Keep running. Keep pressing on. Remember something. The day when God apprehended you, the day God apprehended you, you think you apprehended God. No, he apprehended each one of us. He put a deposit in you. Actually, scripture talks about the proof of salvation as being a deposit of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, you read the parable of the talents. This is one person who intends to collect interest till the last day. Till the last day of your life, the one who put that deposit in you intends to collect interest. He said, I didn't give you my spirit without a reason, without a purpose. I intend to collect interest till the last day of your life. So unlike any other profession in this race, and I believe everyone, one way or other, different forms of ministry, call to ministry, there is no retirement. Nobody retires in the kingdom of God. Because even though you are perishing outwardly, you are being renewed inwardly. So you do not retire. Question is, we have to ask ourselves, is Christ growing in me? In the past six months, has the Holy Spirit been given more control or less control? Does Christ have more of me today than ever before or less of me? 
You need to know in Proverbs 27 verses 23 to 24 in the context of today's message, scripture says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does the crown endure to all generation. You need to know the state of your flocks. You need to know. If you are out there in a shepherd with your sheep, you need to know exact condition of your sheep. And if you are a person, you need to know the exact state of your spirit. Where am I? Where am I in this journey? What is the state? Reason? Riches are not forever. This is for a season. Everybody will, this race has a time beginning and a time ending. It's not forever. It's appointed unto every man to die once. And then it is judgment time. Trophy distribution time. There is a time appointed for everybody. So God says, be diligent to know the state. But to know the state, remember always to know the state or to measure something, there has to be a standard. Always you have to have a standard. If you don't have a standard, you will never know whether your growth is real or proper. Everything. So in Philippians, when Apostle Paul says, or God says through Paul, it is an upward call. In the book of Ephesians, God will say, it is to become like Jesus. An upward call, in Ephesians, he will say, to come to the full measure of Christ Jesus. Are you getting the picture? So there is a standard set forever. It is not a man. It is not Moses. It is not Abraham. It is not Enoch. It is not Elijah. It is not the apostles. It is not the Peter. It is none of these people. The only standard set in the Bible to measure our state is Christ. And therefore God says in this journey... In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, he will say, be careful that you don't drift. Don't drift. To one. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. When he's talking about drifting away, it is talking about the spiritual life, not in the sense of a road, more in the sense of a river. Yes, the road is a river. The river is a road. From the throne room of God in heaven in Revelation 22, you don't have to turn, but there is a river that flows and in the middle of the street, there's a road, it's a street, and the street is a river. Remember, you are on a spiritual road, which is a river. And if any one of you have driven an automatic car, you will see there are four options there. One is park, one is reverse, one is neutral, one is drive. Four options. One is park, one is reverse, one is neutral, one is drive. The only option available in the kingdom of God is drive. Because this is a river not just a road. If you park, the river will take you where you don't want to go. You will drift away. If you reverse, the river will happily take you. And there is no neutrality in this walk with God. Because there is a current. And I'm not talking about the current of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the world as a river. It is a walk of faith. What does God call it? It is a, he didn't say it's a sleep of faith. He said it's a walk, meaning there is movement. There is a definite movement every day. It is called live by faith, meaning there is activity. Certain things we know, like prayer, like meditating on the word, worship, praise, there is absolutely no break from this ever in your life. You never ever in a single day in your life take a vacation from prayer. You cannot afford to. Not even a day. Even when you are on vacation. You don't take a vacation from the word. 
understand that in the world there are a lot of things you can take a break from in the kingdom there are certain things from which you can never take a break unless you are willing to pay the price for it also remember in this walk we have an enemy we have to deal with every day of our lives an unseen enemy jesus calls that enemy by many names but when it came and told us of the nature of the life that he is giving us i have come to give you life and life in abundance he told about that enemy and called him a thief he said the devil is a thief and a thief comes for a purpose he comes to steal to kill to destroy he is not satisfied with stealing alone he is not satisfied with killing you alone because even if you do not know scripture he knows scripture he knows if people are just killed spiritually and left there he knows a man like ezekiel can be sent by god up who will prophesy even over dead bones and bring them back to life so he will destroy you completely so that you and your household will never rise up remember the nature of this thief that's why jesus said the order in which you put is not the kind of order we put it spiritual order the thief comes to steal to kill to destroy you getting the picture get that picture but remember when a thief if he's a good thief when a good thief not in the sense of good in moral character but an expert thief if he's going to steal one of the first things he does is he studies the locality to see who has the goods he doesn't go to a slum and uh, steal there are thieves who steal from slums also that's a poor thief but usually he studies the locality to see who is got the wealth who is got the goods second he studies very carefully the defenses how strong are the defenses and three how careless are the inmates now remember unlike the thief in the town this is a spiritual thief and even if you are not aware and i am not aware this thief knows what true riches are he doesn't want your silver or gold he will give you if you ask he knows what true riches are have you noticed for instance how quickly after service is over within 5 minutes 10 minutes the word you heard is lost have you ever asked who stole it do you remember last sunday's message why don't we remember last sunday's message you know why we don't remember last sunday's message because our defenses are very weak and we are careless he is not after your money he knows very well what true riches is do you know anyone here anybody sitting here who hasn't prayed for the last 5 days and it doesn't even it doesn't even bother you do you know who stole it and who gave it you gave it he stole it he knows what true riches is do you know anyone here if you are one of that who wasted the last 7 days in totally unspiritual things and did not even realize time is something given by god is the absolute common denominator for every man woman child on earth like i keep telling you doesn't matter whether you're king or pauper you get only 24 hours and you will have to account for those 24 hours teach us wednesday we saw teach us the lord to count our days oh when it's in a career and the career is profitable and you are paid for extra and over time how we count our seconds how we count our hours when it is time for retirement how we count our el to cash it then we sit with the i know 
government officer, sit with the section officer and you take your everything and say, no, that year, this one, consolidated all it. How we know how to count our hours, minutes, days. But when it comes to spiritual things, are we aware there is a day that is coming when God says, I will settle accounts with you, not to judge you in wrath, judge you in terms of rewards. How did you use your time? Did you know there was a stealer? There was a thief and he stole that time that was given by me. What about callings and gifts? Though scripture says callings and gifts are irrevocable, once it is given, God doesn't take it back. But the enemy can dull your senses so nicely that you can come to a state where you are not even aware that you have a calling or a gift. And it doesn't matter whether it is Abel, Peter or Timothy. God will have to say, Timothy, stir back to flames the gift you received by the laying of hands. is gone to death, almost dying. You've forgotten. First century church, the disciple of Apostle Paul, gift has gone to sleep, though it is irrevocable. Did Timothy lose it? Did Timothy use it? He did not lose it. Neither did he use it. So it's as good as having lost it. Everybody sitting here, everybody sitting here within the body of Christ has a calling and a gift that goes with the calling. And I'm not talking about the fivefold ministry gifts. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Philippians, uh, sorry, Corinthians 12. You don't have to turn there where scripture talks about the church being a body and every part has a function and every part has been equipped, gifted for that function. What does the devil do? Go to sleep. So today let us look at a very strange portion in the Old Testament. Very strange portion. Just seven verses. It is in the middle of a narrative of certain important incidents in the history of Israel. One chapter talks about we preach, pastors preach over and over and over and over about Naman's healing. The leper, general from Syria who came, had an encounter with prophet Elisha and got healed. And the next chapter will primarily talk about the Arameans and Elisha who hears what the Arameans and the siege of Samaria and the famine of Samaria and how the siege was broken and the famine was over. In the middle of these two narratives is seven verses suddenly put there by God about somebody who lost his axe head. Now, honestly, if you read these narratives in 2 Kings, chapter 6, 5 is about Naman, 6 and 7 is all about the siege, the famine and all, you would ask, Lord, why is these seven verses put in the middle of, you know, in, in Hindi, how do we say? Kebab mein haddi. Why did he put this haddi over here? It doesn't make any sense. So what happens is that most people will skip over it without realizing what scripture says. Everything has been put there for a purpose upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So let's see what is here. And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please, let us go to the Jordan. Let every man take a beam from there. Let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So she, he cut off a stick, threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore, he said, pick it up. For yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. And you see verse 8, the narrative changes completely. We are not looking at the whole seven verses in detail. We look in light of what we God wants us to see today. Because it's a very fascinating story. Fascinating story is 
one of the lessons one of the many lessons in this story is in the midst of growth when one is careless you will lose and if god does in intervene you may not recover it and you need god to intervene to look, to recover what you have lost to bring a restoration back if you go back to verse 1 you will see the sons of the prophet said to elisha see now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us the school of prophets have grown the school of prophets have grown now we'll say okay it's a school of prophets in the old testament what we don't realize is the entire new covenant church is called a school of prophets unlike the old testament the new testament church itself is called a body of prophets not maybe with the prophetic office if you have doubts turn with the first proclamation made on the day of pentecost about the church in acts chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 it doesn't matter whether you are young or old, man or woman, the proclamation over the church of Jesus Christ is prophetic. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And, and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy never happened this in the old testament but this is the promise of the new testament the school of prophets everybody sitting here is part of it there is a proclamation which god made 2000 years ago about his church about his body there is an enlargement that keeps taking place and in the middle of it we see one of the prophet loses his accent he cries out to Elisha, the man of God. And there is a miraculous restoration. What is lost? A weapon of warfare is lost. Something with which you fight, something that is a tool is lost. God steps in and at the cry of his servant, there is a restoration. In moving forward, in pressing on, in moving forward, God has given us weapons or tools. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Because the weapons which we fight with are not carnal. But they have tremendous power to demolish strongholds. Don't lose those weapons. One, don't lose it. Two, see they are properly maintained. I've used this illustration earlier too. If you go to any cantonment area on weekdays, you will see these soldiers, depending upon the nature of their weaponry, always taking it out, oiling it, and putting it back. Always. Doesn't matter even if it's a small revolver or an artillery gun. They take it out, they put it back together, they oil it because they know it has to be maintained properly so that when the time of use comes, it will work. God has given us gifts. Timothy also had a gift. He did not take it out. He did not oil it. He did not use it. He went to rust. Now we are talking about access here. And we are a city bred gas generation. So they don't even know. Do you know what ax looks like? Boys, I'm not talking about the axe effect. <laughs> I'm talking about the axe. The axe has two vital components. One, one it has the axe head. Two, it has the handle. It has the axe head and it has the handle. I hope there is nobody here who doesn't know what an axe looks like. Everybody knows? Anybody who doesn't know? I'll send you a picture by email. Anybody? One, remember, if the accent has to be effective, it has to be sharp. In Ecclesiastic chapter 10 and verse 10, know this, a sharp accent cuts better. 10.10 10. 
if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, one does not sharpen its edge then he must use more strength he must use more strength but wisdom brings success what should you use you should use more strength you will have, you will need more strength why because you did not sharpen your axe a sharp axe cuts better in the secular world or in god's kingdom in the kingdom god has given you gifts or maybe a multiplicity of gifts it is an axe that can fell or cut with persistence and skill even the mightiest of trees it could be a redwood tree been there for 200 years it's as broad as this room but a skilled woodcutter with a sharp axe with persistence and time can bring the tree down are you getting in this story this prophet was not just talking about cutting with a dull axe it was losing the axe completely ask yourself this question i'm not talking about your secular sphere i'm talking about you in the kingdom of god have you lost that ability to make any mark in the kingdom have you lost do you feel sense in your spirit i'm not making any cut anymore i'm not making any i pray but i know it's just flat i worship but i know though nobody knows i know it is flat i read the word but i know it is also just flat my accent has lost the ability to cut in this case of this prophet he did not just lose lose his his sharpness he lost his accent if you lose your accent what do you have left you have a accent handle now in the physical realm nobody would be so stupid enough to try to cut down a tree with an axe handle but in the spiritual realm many do in first corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26 this is what paul says therefore i run thus not with uncertainty thus i fight not as one who beats the air you know what he says i am not shadow boxing i am not shadow boxing i am not trying to cut a tree with the handle i am not are we in the secular world you know if you have lost your cutting edge you have lost your usefulness for the company that's why people in india prefer government jobs because when you lose your cutting edge you still they stay there you just grow old in your job and retire one day in your private company if you lose your cutting edge they will tell you either upgrade yourself or we will replace you cut us and replace Are you getting the picture in the army or in the armed forces if you lose your cutting edge that's when you they pull you off the field and put you in the front desk suddenly the pilot is on ground duty the commandant of rr russia rifles is commandant of the ncc battalion if you look at him he looks the same his uniform is the same his stars are the same the colors on his shirt is the same and to the civilian he looks same but those in the army knows he's been taken off because he's lost his cutting edge in the church we may all look the same but the enemy knows who all have lost their cutting edge we may come in our uniforms worship uniform praise uniform prayer uniform word uniform work uniform but the devil knows whether you cut 
or whether you don't cut. When you lose your cutting edge in the kingdom of God, let me tell you, when you lose, you cannot afford, let me tell you, in the kingdom of God to lose your cutting edge. You will be praying without unction. You will be preaching without fire. You will be laboring without love. You will be singing without passion. You will be serving without compassion. You will be attending church instead of attending to God. That's the difference. Remember the one who lost his accent, his cutting edge, is a man who was involved actively in the kingdom of God. Actually busy in the work of God, in the enlargement of his kingdom. But in the work to which he was doing, which he was called, and you or I are called, the axe head represents the power to get the job done. Remember, Jesus said, without that power, you cannot do anything. Paul said the natural man receives nothing from God. He cannot. But the spiritual man receives things from the spirit. Without the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, let me tell you, in the kingdom of God, nothing happens. Even today, if the spirit isn't there, we would have sang, we would have prayed, I would have preached, we would have heard, and then we just go home. Nothing happens in the kingdom of God. Are you getting the picture? And if you are somebody here who feel deep inside, Lord, this word is speaking to me, then do what this man did in chapter 6, verse 5. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 5. He cried out. Why did he cry out? Why don't we cry out? He cried out because he was acutely aware of the loss. In the physical realm, we are often very aware of material loss. But in the spiritual realm, are we? That's why the reading of the Gospels is fascinating for me. Everybody who comes to see Jesus stops him on the way, begs, falls at his feet. Everybody is aware of physical loss. My son is ill. My servant is ill. Lord, have mercy. Can you make me clean? Then in the middle of the night, one man comes to meet Jesus because he's acutely aware of his spiritual loss. He says, you must be from God. I represent God to these people. But when I see you, I know you are from God because you have something which I have never experienced. Every time Jesus preached and the Pharisees preached and Nicodemus also preached, when Jesus preached, it was written. They all preached from the same text. But when Jesus preached, even the soldiers said, he preaches with authority. He preaches with power. His knife is sharp. His axe is sharp. Sharpened by the Holy Spirit. They were all preachers. 400 years of silence, even before Jesus steps into the place, public limelight, another man in the wilderness, in the desert, is preaching a one-line sermon. Crowds are going to meet him. Why? Because the axe had been sharpened in the wilderness in 30 years and sent out. To cut the hearts of people. And when he cried out, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. From the king downwards, everybody asked, what should we do? Question is, this man was aware. Question is, are we aware? When I lose, my prayer lose its edge, am I aware? Or we just Pray our daily prayer of a father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name and say our standard blessings for our family and get up and go. When your serving has lost its edge, are you aware? Are we aware? The one that sharpens is the Holy Spirit. 
Samson was not aware that the Holy Spirit had left. Though he was doing a lot of gimmicks. He was basically just showing off. Carrying a hill up a mountain. For what? Because the Philistines surrounded the house. The brothel where you were. Samson, for a second, take a look which hill you are climbing. You are climbing a Philistine hill. Hebron is on the other side. Read your text carefully. Here's, he took, he went up the wrong hill. Saul was not even aware. The Holy Spirit had left. But he was very aware. An evil spirit was there. In the midst of church serving, the church of Ephesus was not aware. They had lost their edge, their first love. In the midst of serving, activity, Jesus came and reminded them, Ephesus, your axe has lost its edge. You are not serving with love. You know in the Bible, serving in the kingdom is called labor. It is labor, but it is called a labor of love. And when Paul writes, he says, remember the Lord will not forget your labor of love. It's not that the Lord will not forget your labor. He will not forget your labor of love. Love is that one from the spirit that gives the edge. What are the causes? We are not looking at that in detail. Of losing our cutting edge. In the physical realm, we know if I have to continue working, then I need to eat and to drink. I need rest. Why? I need strength. Eat, drink, rest. Three fundamental things so that I have strength to work. In Isaiah 44 and verse 12, scripture also saw this, but this is spiritual. The blacksmith with the thong tongs works one in the coal, fashions it with hammers, works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. Now, this is true in the physical realm. This is even more true in the spiritual realm. The only problem, we are acutely aware of the physical realm. If you have fasted for two days, oh, pastor, I'm so tired. I'm feeling so weak. But when you haven't prayed for seven days, when you haven't read your word for five days, when you haven't come to church for two Sundays, you are not even aware that your strength is faint. Are we? That's why the cry of Jesus. All those who are thirsty, come and drink. The Bible ends up with the bride and the Holy Spirit saying, come and drink. Jesus calls. I'm not talking about that ministry. <laughs> Do you know in the Bible, in the gospel, there are nine fundamental calls of Jesus. And each one of them is come. Every one of these calls, that each one of it is a message in itself. Each one of them is the start and the end of the spiritual journey. At each point, Jesus says, come. It's an invitation. To you and to me. It's an invitation. The first invitation is universal. If I'm right, it's Matthew 11 and verse 28. Universal invitation to everybody. He looks at everybody around the world and says, come to me. All you labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What does he say to the world? He looks at everybody laboring under the yoke of sin. Laboring under the weight of sin and says, come to me. I will give you rest. Some respond to this. Many don't. To those who respond, there is a second Call. We saw that last week in John chapter 1 and verse 39. He says, He said, Come and see. Lord, where do you stay? 
you call me you told me that you will give me rest where do you stay he says come and come and see then what does he say as you start he says come and drink does everybody know that portion on the last day of the feast he said come and drink start the journey keep drinking till the end but when you start drinking and following him in mark chapter 10 and verse 21 he tells something else what does he say then jesus looking at him or her or anybody here loves you and says one thing you lack you want to follow me but there is a problem between you following me and you there is one thing which you are holding on to go your way sell whatever you have give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and come take up your cross and follow me he says i will give you direction in your life i'll give you direction suddenly you have direction in your life you get rid of that pick up your cross follow me lord for what he gives you purpose in mark chapter 1 verse 17 and jesus said follow me and i will make you fishers of men follow me i'll give you purpose in life in the kingdom the purpose in the kingdom is to make us fishers of men and as you start following this lord and following this purpose he knows we will get tired we will get disheartened we will get discouraged to them what will he say those who followed this purpose to them god will say in john 21 and verse 12 what will he say jesus said come and eat breakfast I know you are tired. I know you are weary. I know you are discouraged. So do one thing. Come dine with me. And you get that strength back with the Lord and you continue this journey and then suddenly you are overwhelmed by the ministry. You know what it is to be overwhelmed by ministry? 15 things calling for your attention. everybody calling for prayer everybody calling for ministry and new ministry is sprouting up and you are worn out and you are burned out so what does jesus say in mark 6 and verse 31 he will tell you son remember this is my work through you not your work what does he say he said to them come aside by yourself to a deserted place and rest a while take a break with me come apart come out leave it just leave it leave it alone come apart with me and rest come apart with me rest and then go back to your ministry and then when you go back to your ministry the ministry also can be a circle god says the walk with god even in ministry is not a circle it is a upward path but when you get used to a certain kind of ministry there is a comfort in the flesh in that ministry because now you know the tricks of that ministry are you getting the picture you know the tricks of that ministry like when i began 20 years ago i did not begin with preaching that was not i preached yes but i began with power ministry that is interesting right who doesn't like power ministry you lift your hands pray or people dung 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 they all fall that's nice right now you don't have to preach much how much do you have to study to make people fall yet you get all the attention just imagine worship leader is there all you are asked to do is come and say a few words worship leader will look at me his name is also david he looks at me and i will say and i'll tell him when the spirit tells i will come that's all i have to do i know st- 
occasions nobody is there the hall is full worship leader looks at me and i says i am coming i take the microphone and i just say in the name of jesus everybody is down and one fellow has gone four steps behind and hit the wall how much do you have to prepare for this he said it is a good ministry then one day the lord said i will take it away and give you something else but this time you have to work hard you have to learn you will teach so in ministry also remember there is a progress there is a shift there is a change otherwise we'll get used to the the familiarity of ministry and then familiarity breeds content ah, what's the problem you don't need 15 minutes i will tell you what your problem is i've seen 15 like you before but each one's problem is unique each one god says as an individual but we get very familiar why which is true you know its problem but the point is that god doesn't deal that way god knows everybody's problems here right but he deals with us individually we get familiar with ministry and god says no you've been called to higher ground so there is another call the eighth call in ministry is in matthew 14 and verse 29 who are willing and brave and obedient so he said come peter said lord if you are lord bid me come what jesus is walking on water now i saw a painting of this and it was incredible you have to sometimes you have to see this artist jesus was not walking on still waters it's the waves and jesus is calmly walking over the waves and peter saw that and he said lord if it is you bid come i also want to walk like that and what did jesus say come now you have to get out of the familiar comfortable used ministry of the boat and step into the waves only one did levin sat he stepped out but god calls says come then when finally your ministry is over everything is over and the end the curtain is rolled up there is this final come that is in matthew 25 and verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of the father inherit the kingdom you see there are nine invitations of jesus christ come 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 but this is the final one this is the proclamation of the judgment but for the other eight you and i have been given the spirit we have been given a gift of the spirit and we have to ask ourselves where am i stuck on this road am i just another onlooker in the kingdom has my accent lost its edge is it blunt is it hardly making a mark or have i actually lost my accent right many accents are there one of them is prayer right we pray probably next sunday we will look at one of the most sharpest prayers in the bible everybody prays everybody is supposed to pray but if many of you are called to pray how sharp is your acts in ephesians 6 and verse 18 scripture says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints do you see how many alls are there and ask yourself if i have been called to pray and i have been given the spirit of intercession how sharp is my accent according to this one verse how many prayers in the bible have i really asked the spirit to teach me from from the prayer of abraham for abimelech to the prayer of moses at different stages to the cry of hanna how many prayers to the greatest of all prayers jesus prayer at gethsemane how sharp is my axe because prayer is an axe in the hands of one who has been called to pray right like i said in the beginning the axe has two components 
One is the handle, the other is the axe. Now you have to look at the two levels. At one level, each one of us is an axe in God's hand. The other level, the gift of God is an axe in my hand. When it comes to the first one, please remember, every handle is chosen by the axe cutter and shaped to fill the axe head. Chosen and shaped. Every one of you sitting here, every one of us was chosen by God. And he's shaping you to fit that gift, that axe head. Some of you may not have received your axe head because you refuse to be shaped by God. If you allow yourself to be shaped by God, you will receive your axe head. Because we are called living stones who are called to be living sacrifices, which means you have to every day cooperate with God. There has to be surrender. The more surrender, the more quickly the Lord shapes you and me. But remember, we are using illustrations from old days because today we don't use illustration of an axe. Because most people do not know. How many of you here honestly sitting here in this church have used an axe to cut split wood? Okay, I did. My mother did. We all used axes. And we grew up. Regularly we used axes. And if you don't know how to use an axe, you don't split wood, you will split your leg. And to use an axe, it is not strength, it is skill. A good, skillful axe cutter can make the chips fly with the least amount of strength. It is not strength, it is skill. The axe had slipped, flew from the handle and dropped into the water. What does it mean? It was not fixed carefully. If your gift, if you are not shaped according to your gift, if you don't allow God to shape you according to your gift, it will fly off. Or rather, that's why we have the term in English, you will fly off the handle. You know what that means? You have mad prophets and angry evangelists. Why? You keep on flying off the handle. Because you... And the gift has not been fixed properly. You have a gift of the Spirit, but you have been matured in the fruit of the Spirit. So you fly off the handle. Do you know what the axe cutter actually does? Let me explain to all the young children who have, do not know what an axe cutter does. It's kind of like this, okay? He gets the axe head, he puts in, Remember, down it is narrower, here it is broader. He takes the axe head, fixes it, and then at the top, he makes a slit. He cuts the top. He breaks the top carefully. Otherwise, he will split the whole axe handle, and he puts a wedge there. Now the axe head is tight in the handle. Whenever it becomes a little loose, what does he do? He just taps the wedge back in. Are you getting the picture? The axe cutter has to be very careful. Otherwise, he will break the whole handle. It will just split from top to bottom. If he uses too much force, the wood will split. Do you know who the axe cutter is? The divine axe cutter is God. Before he can fix the axe set properly in you, he has to break you. He doesn't destroy you, but you are useless. That man does. God breaks you so that you are more useful. And to see that your brokenness, if you allow him, remains.
check, check. To see that you remain that way, and because God has purpose in your life, He leaves a wedge there. And if you have been genuinely called by God and genuinely experienced God, you will know there is one area of your life which is constantly broken, kept there as a wedge to keep you humble. He will not repair that because it is for your safety. Whether you are a servant of God now or a servant of God then, Paul said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Let that wedge be there. I can heal you instantly if I want, but I will not. That wedge needs to remain there. And whenever you get a little puffed up because your handkerchiefs are healing people, you know what I will do? I will take it. You will come back to your senses. Okay. You will see down the history, any man of God, from the beginning till the end, God had a wedge in their life and kept it there. Allow him to do it. So that we remain broken till the end. Often what happens is, one of the first signs is that when the wedge flies off, for a time you are not aware that the wedge is gone. Because, because of long use, the handle is still standing like split. But after a period of time, the gap will start closing and the accent will start becoming loose. Now in the light of this, ask why Paul kept on saying, even at the end of his life, worst of sinners, chief of sinners. Have you been, haven't you not been forgiven, Paul? Yes, I have been. Aren't you the righteousness of Christ? Yes, I am. Then why are you saying it? Because that's the wedge. That's the wedge there. The wedge goes, after some time the accent will slip off. That is what the old man in Philippian cries. Lord, help me. In Philippians 3 and verse 10, he says, Lord, help me to me remain broken in your service till the very end. I don't want to know anything else, O oh Lord, but to share in the, the fellowship of your sufferings and being confirmed to your death. He never says, I want to be, I want to be confirmed to your glory. That is later. That's in God's hands, to your death. Getting the picture? Pray, Lord, keep me in the handle. Lord, let not my accent rust. Help me to keep it sharp. In Proverbs 27 and verse 17, this is what scripture says. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Those of us, again, those are used to old time knives and axes. Where do you sharpen the axe? Either on a rock or on another metal. That's how you sharpen it. Before these newfangled stones you get at these shops and all became, that's how normally man sharpened iron. Iron sharpens iron. What did Jesus call his friends? Disciples? Friends. Who is that friend that sharpens your countenance? It is Jesus. If you want to be sharp in the kingdom, I'm not talking about dressed sharply. That's also another usage in English. He's dressed so naturally or sharply. We're not talking about that. If you want to be sharpened in the kingdom, let your countenance be sharpened by that friend who is the rock of ages. Because he will sharpen you. Let him be the man you seek to be friendly with more than anybody else. More than anybody else, Lord. I want to be you to be my friend. Even if it costs me all other friends. You are my model. Help me, Spirit of God, to keep my eyes on Jesus and learn of him. If you keep Jesus as your model, and the church has to keep Jesus as the model, then only everything will fall into place. That is the standard. And where did this iron come from? The iron is pulled deep 
beneath the earth. So are we being pulled, I hope so, from deep from the world. Then the iron is put through the fire to get rid of the impurities. And the Lord will put every child of His through the refining fire before it can become anything in His hands. And then the blacksmith takes that iron and starts hammering it. Are you, oh Lord, why are you doing it? To sharpen your child. Lord, it is too painful. No pain. Okay. Have God told you that? Listen carefully, you will hear. God also uses English proverbs. <laughs> okay. What does God do? He gives his children into the hands of his anointed servants to shape them into weapons of warfare. They are called blacksmiths in the world and in the kingdom. In Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 13, they are called the fivefold ministry which are God's blacksmiths. What are they called? And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the job of the blacksmiths. That each one is a mighty weapon in the hands of God. We know that's the psalm from where we quote during every baby dedication. What is that? Children are like arrows in the cure of a mighty man. Do you know who that mighty man is? That is Jesus Christ. Do you know who the arrows are? You and I. And we are the ones who are supposed to contend with his enemies at his gate. Knowing with the knowledge, I have been shaped, I have been put, I have been sharpened, I have been forged in the fire and I have been made ready and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. The job of the blacksmith. This is a five-fold ministry. That's a purpose. That's why we have tough sermons. Why? Forging you into weapons for the final war. The end of, end war. The last day's war. Forging you. First Samuel chapter 9, 13 verses 19 to 22. Understand the strategy of the devil. This is the devil. He knows scripture very well. He understands spiritual warfare. Even if we don't, he knows. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the whole land of Israel. Who was not to be found? Not carpenter. Not mason. Not teacher. Not physicians. No blacksmith. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. Understand spiritual warfare. What will the devil, whom will the devil go after? The fivefold ministry. To see they are made redundant. They are no longer making weapons of war. Do you see it has happened? Look around the churches around the world. How many weapons of war are being formed and sent out? What did the Philistines say? They said, go after the blacksmiths so that the Hebrews will have no spears or swords. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe and his sickle. And the charge for sharpening was okay. Okay, the charge, let's say. So it came about on the day of the battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. On the day of war, nobody had. What did the Philistines do? We're very sorry. It's a true two-pronged attack. Understand the strategy of the devil in the last days. Did you see what they did? One, they removed or compromised. Today's modern term, they compromise the blacksmiths. But everybody needs a blacksmith. So they supplanted the Hebrew blacksmiths with Philistine blacksmiths. The Philistine blacksmiths are very careful. They will look at what you bring and they will only sharpen instruments for agriculture. 
Why? Because it profits them too. If Israel has a good harvest and no weapons, the Philistines will come and profit from your harvest, yet you will not be able to fight them. Do you think any government in anywhere in the world doesn't like Christian businesses flourishing as long as you don't pray? Because you will employ people. You will pay in more taxes. Do you think they have any objections to your good works? Take in the orphans. Take in the mentally retarded children. Take in the HIV children. We have absolutely no problem with that. Put in your money. Take care of them. Take care of our job. But if you start praying and preaching, we will watch you. We will watch you. As long as what you do profits us, it doesn't matter. But if what you do along with that or without that is a danger to us, then we shall watch you. Understand that. Let me tell you. We forget the God who prospers, the God who heals, the God who delivers, the God who does everything and starts making each of these into little gods. Forgetting the primary call of God is to repentance unto salvation. Do you know that they have no objections even to have crusades as long as it is healing drug meetings or deliverance meetings and as long as there are no salvation cards or commitments or prayers made, they have no issues. Because they also get healed. So even in Muslim nations, Benihin will be allowed to go. Why? I am holding a healing meeting. Watch out. How has the Philistines compromised the ministry? Because they have ministry, they have compromised by infiltrating the church and now they are preaching about sharpening your instruments of prosperity. I will teach you, brother, special seminar for businessmen, how to prosper in business. Financial prosperity, health, wealth, face, complexion, everything they teach you except warfare. I'm not kidding. Just go back today for one week, listen to every message on the channel and listen to what they actually teach. They're not teaching you to fight the spiritual war. They have taken the God who does all these things and made them into different, different gods. Split them into different, different gods. You know who said about this? Deborah said about this in Judges 5 and verse 8. Listen to Deborah. One of the first prophetesses in the Bible. Listen to what she said. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among the 40,000 of Israel. Are you getting the picture? How many seminars for all these different things people have attended. But when it comes to real spiritual warfare, they are not equipped. They are not equipped. This is the strategy of the devil. First, remove their weapons. Two, remove the people who know how to make those weapons and sharpen them. Remove the people who know how to make these weapons and sharpen them. Target those ministries. Why are those ministries always under attack? Why was from the day he came into limelight till the day he died in a road accident, why was David Wilkerson under attack practically every day of his life? Because he was a true blacksmith sharpening a generation to fight this battle. Look at the ministries who are actually under attack. They are not under attack. For any other reason other than because they are sharpening instruments to fight this battle. Now let me ask you this question. Are you just a collector? I'm not talking about district collector. You know collectors of weapons? 
If you go to some really well-to-do houses, you will see guns everywhere. Oh, that is a 1921 Winchester. That is a 1903 Enfield. Oh, this is the latest from Sweden. This is Glock 2. Brother, do you know how to use any one of them? No, brother, I am a collector. I am what? A collector. That is a cold peacemaker, but I don't know how to make peace. I'm not kidding. Once upon a time, I was one of that. And I've seen many like me still go to their house, one section in the library of intercessory prayer. He unbounds to everybody is there. Brother, do you pray? No, brother, that's my collection. <laughs> How many collections we have? <laughs> Ultimately, he will come for a collection. He has promised that. What I'm saying, let the thief get into the house, none of these weapons will work. Fellow will take that also and go and say, I can sell it as an antique. Have we become like that? Has the church in the 21st century become like that? A collector of relics of the Bible. Question is, have we become people for whom the Holy Spirit is just an ornament in our life? Just an ornament in our life. Yes, brother, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit 15 years ago. Okay, and what have you done? With and through the Holy Spirit. What has God done? The Holy Spirit was not given without a reason or without a purpose. He was given for a reason and for a purpose. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. It's not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. Don't be just a relic in God's kingdom. They also may make it. Don't be just a relic. Like I told last week in the evening service, there are only two priorities in a child of God's life. Everything else is secondary, subsidiary. One, the worship of God must touch every aspect of my life. I have been created, bought again to worship Him. And worship touches every area of my life. It is not just singing. Two, the salvation of souls till the kingdom of God becomes. All the kingdoms of this world becomes the kingdom of God. The salvation of souls is His priority, therefore is my priority and your priority. To whatever we are calling, doing now, it is focused on this. I have been created to worship and I am called to win souls. Ask ourselves, is that my priority? If you are not, if that is not your priority, then you are just a relic. I have lost my cutting edge. Or do I need to work on my cutting edge? Have I become satisfied? Have I become complacent? How is my prayer life six months later? How is my prayer life? How is my word life? How is my faith life? If you look at recovery next week, not this week, ask yourself, how is it? Where am I? Where am I in this journey which I began, you began, you each one knows when you began, where am I? Or have we been overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the enemy, by the issues of life? Issues of life. Last Wednesday, and uh, last Thursday at two different meetings. I told you about commanded blessings, which people don't still don't get it. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2, and verse 8 once again. If you don't get this into your heart, you will never finish your course as an overcomer. He says, now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, 
to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high among all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you, overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And verse 8. And the Lord will command. You know what? They have taught us for years to demand blessings of God. God says, you don't have to demand any blessings from me. If you obey me, I have commanded blessings into your life. It's a difference from demanded blessings and commanded blessings. When you are demanding blessings, your focus is on the blessings and you're wasting your life over unnecessary things. Yet when you're focused on the kingdom and his purpose and obeying his voice, he says, I have commanded blessings into your storehouse. I have commanded. Like I said on that day in the meeting, we do not work to earn our provision. No, we do not. We work. You know why? Because God is the worker. We've been created in the image of God. When Jesus came down and he was questioned, he said, my father and I have been at work from the beginning even now. Why do we work? Why do we work? We work because God is a worker. Provision, our work may be just a means of our provision, but not the only means. You know the first time when God talks about work, man's work, is in Genesis 2 verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it, to work. Now what I want to, you to focus so that you get this, otherwise I'm telling you, miss the purpose for which God caught hold of you. Look at verse 8 of the same chapter. And the Lord God, Genesis 1 will tell you about everything from day 1 to day 6, except for man. Everything was created by the word of his mouth. He spoke, it came into being. He spoke, he came into being. He spoke, he came into being. He spoke, he came into being. Right? But when it came to man, he did not speak. He said, this shall be the work of my hands. Man shall be the work of my hands. He made him in his image and breathed his life into him. And he says, you know what? This is my son. I made him with my hands, breathed my spirit into him. I cannot speak a garden into existence for him. I shall plant it myself. It was planted by God. The provision for his son Adam and Eve was planted by the father. Do you think he hasn't planted the provision for you and me? Has he changed? The only thing he told Adam is, Adam, don't work for your provision. Work because your father is a worker. Your father is a worker. I'm telling you why, because this is the trap into which the devil through the world system will grab you so that you miss your purpose because you're worried always about provision, 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 provision. And you slog day and night for provision and forget the work to which God called you. Yet we are hard workers. Why? Because Jesus is a hard worker. Very, very hard worker. And as we close, as we close, just come to Genesis, sorry, 1 Kings chapter 17. 17, verse 3, 2 to 4, first 2 to 4. Now this is a servant of God who is obeying the voice of God and listening to his commands. What did God say? The word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, hide by the brook chariot which flows into Jordan and it will be that you shall drink from the brook and I have, what is that? Did you see commanded blessings for the one who obeys? What is he going to do? Plow? Shepherd? Just sit under the tree and pray for this nation. I have commanded provision into your life. That's the work you have been called to do now. Yes, the rest of Israel is struggling. There is famine. They're going to struggle. They're going to run around. They're going to walk long miles for water. You don't have to worry. You do what I call you to do. I have commanded provision into your life. 
Then the brook dries. Verse 8. Will you listen to my voice, O Elijah? Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have. I have. Why do you think he had the courage to tell a poor woman with one handful of atta and oil, saying, make it and give it to me? Because he already knew God had commanded it to her. Did you see commanded blessings in the Bible? There are commanded blessings. He has. That's what Ephesians 1.3 says. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Whatever God has called you to do in his kingdom, provision has already been set aside for it. And what are you called to be? Whatever you are in life, you are called to be a mighty, sharp axe in his hands, which will bring down powers of darkness. The devil will come and he will make you careless, sloppy, so that either you will lose your edge or you will lose your accent. Then it is lost. Thank God he cried. Many people don't even cry. Either what do they do? Because it is spiritual, they keep on swinging with the handle. And feel good. You know what? I swung so nicely with the handle today. I feel so good. I feel really good because when the accent was there, I had to swing ten times. Now I feel really exercised because I am swinging easier than before. You don't realize the accent has gone. That's why the swinging is easier. Absolutely pleased. God says no. First, recognize your loss. Do you know you have lost it? And how does it affect your loss? Timothy had gone to sleep. Somebody had to come and wake him up. Do you have to be woken up? Are you woken up this morning? Does God have to shake you and wake you up? I believe by now each one of you should have some inkling of what your primary calling is. If that you know your primary calling, my question to you, whether you are young or old, what are you doing with that? What are you doing with that? How are you equipping yourself to sharpen yourself in that area? What are you doing? If you are called to pray, what are you doing about it? Are you sharpening your prayer life? If you are called to teach, preach one day, are you? Yes? I agree, I said last Sunday, sometimes it just takes me 45 minutes to get that day's sermon. That's all it takes. But not true. That 45 minutes of getting a sermon on a Sunday morning is because of 30 years of labor with the word of God. That's why it's 45 minutes. Because everything is there is labor involved. 30 years there is a labor un ceasing labor that is going on. Because once you know this is what you have been called to do, preach and teach, you set your priorities very clearly. This is what I have to do. And if you know what your priority is, set your priorities and say, I'm cutting off everything else off. And I'm talking to worship leaders here, those who have been gifted. You know, you, your gift is from God. Are you sharpening it? Really, really sharpening it. I know there has been a change in the worship in the past few months. It's come to a higher level. Don't get set to that. There is always a higher level with God. Always a higher level with God. Always. When you are 90 years old and you think you are the last apostle standing on a rocky island, God comes and tells him, come on, I saw you worshipping, it's good, come up higher. It ain't over, John, until I tell you it is over. John must have told, I have done my, finished my race. I have got, fought the good fight. Now let me, God said that was for Paul, not for you. You get up here. You still have to write the best part. You haven't finished. You haven't finished yet. We haven't finished till it is over. We haven't finished. We haven't finished. Sharpen, sharpen young men and young girls. 
young people older people sharpen you know should know by now sharpen your skills let the holy spirit hone you hone you hone you any hone you you know old days they carried knives sharpened hone that if they did not have the razor they could shave with it that's how they kept their blades because the sharpness of your blade saved your life let me tell you the day and the hour is coming the sharpness of your spiritual life alone will protect you alone will protect you the sharpness the day and the hour is coming when a set of people will come and run to you and says what will we do abel what will we do peter the enemy is coming and you will be able to say lord open his eyes let him see the ones with us are more than the ones who are against us because your spiritual senses have been sharpened by the spirit of god you will see you have to see you have to see that is the elisha anointing you have to see that is what elijah said you want okay if you see how i am taken that means you are qualified i saw i saw he said i saw i was honed by the spirit of god at chariot refined at zarephath anointed with fire on mount carmel did you see me run outrun the chariot of ahab did you see me run he says you need to remember Elijah did not bring fire from heaven once almost 10 years later the king sent people to get Elijah and he said if i am a servant of god let fire come down from heaven he could bring fire down heaven at his will there's a difference first time he had to do everything according to the word of god and had no clue he said lord i have done everything according to your word prove yourself 10 years later he had proved god and he says i know god god knows me let fire come down 10 years it was under that man elisha learned and was taught and studied did you see as soon as elijah was taken out and elisha stepped forward and a set of young rowdies came out and mocked him bald man and he said bears you come out i'm not calling fire now a bear will do the work spiritual warfare when the lord tells you need to know how to release the bears and the lions against your enemies instead of them coming against you when the lord tells you you need to know how to turn the slingshot at the forehead of the powers of darkness that is facing you he will tell you how to fight you need to know how to call fire down from heaven against the powers of darkness who's oppressing you there is through the bible hidden strategy how to fight this battle you don't by find it in textbooks you find it in your prayer closet It has to be taught one to one by a living God. That's why we are called living stones. Are we getting the picture? Rise up, as we sang today, as we prayed today, as we heard today. Rise upward, Lord. I know, Lord. It was not an accident. You and I were born in the twenty-first century when everybody knows the end is near. If God didn't reserve His best for the end, you, we wouldn't have been born now. if he keeps the best for the end then start believing if you have little doubt use maybe maybe i am one of the best and if you think you are one of the best lord spirit of god here i am i want to be the best you can make me into and lord i have one prayer don't take the wedge off the handle keep me broken before you all the days of my life keep me broken keep me broken shall we pray oh father how wonderful are your ways oh lord how awesome are you 
Truly, Lord, you use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. When the world sees us, your church, they see a set of weak people, foolish people, jobless people, who keep gathering through the week to hear the word. But it is to those people you say, I see you have very little strength and I see you have held on to the truth. Therefore, I keep this door open. And the door that I have kept open, no man can shut. No man can shut. Church, each one here, if you are weak and if you have held fast to the truth, or even desire to hold fast to the truth, the Lord says, the door that he opens for you, no man can shut. There are doors which only God can open. And those doors no man can shut. And we go through that doors not because we have great strength, but actually because we have very little strength. But we have put our trust in His strength. Because we are absolutely, totally aware inside of our helplessness. And yet the enormity of the God we serve. That He called us, He chose us, He redeemed us, He restored us, He put us on the rock, He is showing us the direction. And there is purpose. For everyone here, there is purpose. And the devil comes on the way with all his trinkets and his false promises. And before the war is over, he wants to take our weapons of warfare and make them into instruments of agriculture. God says, no, that I will do another time. When I have come back onto earth and established my kingdom, that is when I will turn your weapons of warfare into plowshares. Till then, they are weapons. And they need to be sharpened weapons and be skillful, learn how to use it. Like the Benjaminites in the old days with their left hand, with a the sling, they could split the hair. God says, how good are you? With the sling of God's word. Are you able to preach in season or off season? Are you able to use a word with absolute accuracy and split the hair of the devil? He say, be skillful in warfare. Be skillful in warfare. Redeem the time for the days are evil. Yet those who redeem and are prepared by the Holy Spirit will rise up like a mighty army in these last days. Kings and rulers and princes will tremble before young men and young women, before boys and girls who stand under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and will be able to say with their mouth, Thus says the Lord of Israel. Oh Father, let your children know what is the spirit of prophecy. Let your children know and desire what it is to have that spirit. Oh, as Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, it is like fire shut in our bones. We cannot but speak. We cannot but utter. Oh, even when the enemy comes against us like a flood, yet we will raise up a standard and the enemy cannot shut our mouths because it's fire. It's fire. Pray, Father, today there would be an impartation in the hearts of these young ones, Lord. They would have an experience as your disciples on the road to Maus, O Lord. Let their hearts burn within them, O Lord, because you are here in their midst. Let there be a burning inside of God, young and old. Let there be a burning inside of God. Because I believe the hour, the hour, the hour for India is coming. The hour of harvest is coming. 
Rise up. An army, Lord. Army that will not falter. An army that will not fumble. An army that will not be careless. An army that will not lose their accents. An army that will stand. They will stand in the strength of God. In the power of God. With the eyes of God. With the vision of God. An army of young and old who will stand, O oh God. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. I bless your children in your name. Everyone. The youngest to the oldest. Let none be faint-hearted. Let no one's hands droop. Strengthen feeble legs and feeble hands. Let them stand. Let the hands be lifted up. And when everything is over, let them be still found standing at their post. Because it is you who fights this battle. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I pray, Lord, they will go in this spirit, each one of us, through this next six months. Let there be a great awakening in each life. In each of the ministries you have committed into their hands. Let there be awakening in this country, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We just praise you. We just bless you. We just glorify your holy name. For there is none like thee. There is none like thee. We take authority in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I bind and I rebuke every spirit of infirmity in the body of Christ. Every spirit of infirmity, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Take your hands of God's children. Every spirit of fear, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. Let there be a spirit of boldness, of courage, of strength and power. Be released and be found in the body of Christ. Let there be a restoration of vision, restoration of hearing. Those who have lost the hearing of the voice of God, let there be a restoration. Like that man, that servant who lost his accent at the command of Elisha, where did you lose it? He knew exactly the point where he had lost his. I pray, Father, you will bring into the remembrance of each one here where they lost their cutting edge. They would go back with you there and recover it. Because you are the Lord who recovers and restores. Because the gift we lost was not ours. As that man said it to us, lent. The spirit was given to us. It is not ours. It was given to us for a reason and for a season. Alas, Lord, it was not mine. Alas, Lord, it was not ours. It was given. To what is given an account has to be given. Lord, I pray, Lord, they will recover. They will recover. Your children will recover. Each one of us will recover. Oh, Lord, recover. And be found at our post. Skillful with his battle axes, felling mighty trees in the enemy's realm. Felling them. Felling them one after other. Not because they are strong in themselves, but because they are strong and skillful in thee, O Lord. Because you are the warrior of old. Moses cannot split seas. Joshua cannot bring down walls. Elijah cannot bring down fire. But the Spirit of God can. O Spirit of God, you can. Always you can. You are the same. From the beginning till the end, you are the same. Father, I pray today first upon all your children that let there be an impartation of that consuming, dirt consuming fire, refining fire of the Holy Spirit. Consume that muckiness, O oh God. Consume it. Sanctify vessels, O oh God, today. Sanctify before you can fill. Sanctify, Father. Sanctify. From here, from the pulpit to the last one at the back, let there be a, a cleansing of vessels today, Lord, so that you can use each one for a noble, for a nobler use.
Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. Do your work. Do your work, Lord. Do your work in us, Lord. Bind every stubborn spirit in the name of Jesus. Let there be a release in the house of God. Let there be a release in the house of God. Let there be a cleansing. Let there be an emptying. Like that widow, let every empty vessel be brought into the house of God and let the doors be shut. Let there be an impartation of oil, O God. Enemy will not see what is happening in the house of God. He will not see what is happening in the house of God. I shut his eyes. Let the doors of your house be shut. Let there be an impartation in your house today, Father. Oh, Father. Until your servants say, no more. No more empty vessels. No more empty vessels. Until every vessel is filled, O God, during this season, let not the oil stop flowing. Until every vessel, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, until every vessel in GTC here and worldwide is filled, let not the oil stop flowing. Let it not flow. Let it continue to flow from heaven, Lord. Because these are vessels called for a mighty purpose. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you. Who are we, Lord? Who are we? To be called, to be separated, to be chosen, to be used. Who are we? All we can do is lift our hands up and bless your holy name. Holy name. Holy name. That one day, we'll have the privilege to sit at the table with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob, with Elijah and Elisha and Paul and Peter. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Be with your church worldwide. Be with your servants worldwide. Those who are ill, those who are wounded. God of Israel, arise and be a wall of fire around Zion. This season, especially the next 30 days, I speak blindness into the ranks of the enemy. I speak confusion into the ranks of the enemy. Absolute total disarray in the ranks of the enemy. O God of Israel, arise. Shout, O God. Let your enemies scatter. Arise and shout, O God, in the lives of your children here and your children everywhere. Shout. Let the enemies scatter. For the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But the God of Israel, let him arise with healing under his wings. With life, life abundance. Your children shall go from your house. Like calves released from the stalls. Bounding, bounding, bounding. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Holy, 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 holy. Holy God, Holy God, we just thank you. We just praise you. We just worship you. May your children go in peace. Let the comfort of the Holy Spirit be their portion. Let them know. All those who have cried out in your house, let them know they are forgiven. Let them know they are forgiven. That their trespasses, you remember no more. Let them go with their consolation. For your name itself, O oh Lord, is that you are the consolation of Israel. Let them know today, you are the consolation of the Israel of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the sweet, powerful, abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion. Amen.